Hello, it's a beautiful day outside, so I thought I could spend it with you guys here in the room uh, talking about visual effects. So far we didn't talk about one special aspect of visual effects called invisible effects. Nowadays a lot of films use it, so what are invis invisible? So mostly it's all kinds of wire removals or cleanups in the shot, right? So for example, you have something that's period inaccurate in your shot, like this windshield sticker that's obviously modern and wouldn't be here in the 1960s. So I just clone stamped over it, thus making this scene period accurate. But it can be of course a lot more complex than this. When you see a shot like this, you obviously know it's an effect because such a location or event doesn't exist and therefore couldn't be filmed. So obviously it's CGI. But what about this shot? It's just a shot of a guy on the street. Nothing special about it, right? Except the whole street is CGI. This is from a David Fincher film called Zodiac. Uh, it's a great film if you haven't watched it. They needed to recreate that exact street as it appeared in the 60s. And instead of actually building half of the neighborhood, they decided to do it with visual effects. And back in 2007, when this thing came out, I remember like being totally mind blown by this because nobody's ever seen anything like that before. We were all, like, everybody was talking about it, right? This scene has tons of visual effects in it and you're looking straight at them, but you don't really see them. So for this episode, let's look at some invisible work that we did uh, in our film. Uh, nothing as spectacular as Fincher stuff, but uh, not necessarily less cool. The scene that probably needed most invisible effects was the NASA press conference. There was this establishing shot and the widest lens that we had on that filming day was this one. Dino and me felt the shot is not wide and impressive enough, so I told the camera guy to film every part of the room, left and right and up and down, and I could then extract an image out of every angle and stitch them into one ultra-wide shot. But there was no audience in the seats. So we filmed our friends again, turning them slightly for each take so that I could get every body angle that I needed. And then it was just a matter of painstakingly populating the auditorium. And of course we only had 8 people, so they are repeating many times, but I tried to arrange them in a random fashion so it's not noticeable. It's also a pretty dark shot in the end, so I was pretty sure it's gonna work. This is the shot that the camera originally filmed, and this is the VFX shot. You gotta agree that it's much more impressive. Another invisible uh, but also incredibly stupid effect that we needed to pull off was this one. They're doing some school plays and something, you know, in this space. So they glue a lot of stuff on these curtains and there's so many leftover paper and it looks like shit in the shot. And we'll probably have to delete like a hundred of them in post. And I was completely right about that. This is how the filmed shot looked. And it just wouldn't be appropriate that an event of this caliber has dirty curtains. So I clone stamped these dirty patches one by one for each individual shot. Thankfully our whole directing style for this film was pretty static and the camera was locked off in these shots, which made it a lot easier. The problem though was that the actors moved as they acted and the stamped parts would show over their faces. And the only way to fix that was to rotoscope them back on top of it. Rotoscoping is a technique of tracing a person or, uh, or an object frame by frame and thus isolating it from the background and it's a major pain in the ass. Now there are some AI tools that can help with rotoscoping and I did use them for some easier shots. Uh, they basically try to recognize the shapes on screen and separate them from the background but they're still not that smart unfortunately. Uh, every few frames they screw up and then you have to fix it all the time and in the end you get a flickering edge that simply doesn't look good. So I could use it sometimes but for the cases where it needs to be pixel perfect there's no other way but to do it manually. So once again this is the original shot, then I covered the ugly dots but now when the actors move, they go under the cleaned elements, so I needed to rotoscope them and bring them back over the clean background. And the same boring process was done for every shot, until I came to this one. This shot is pretty cleverly filmed, because we only had about 20 extras on that day, and we arranged them here on the right side. There's literally no one out of frame here, and on the left side we placed a few standing extras, and as the main guy enters the shot, he stops on the left at just the right time, hiding the fact that there's no one there. You can perhaps see the empty chairs for just a few frames, but all in all it works great. I'm actually happy that it shows, because I, I like seeing uh, revealing mistakes like this in other movies, you know, it just shows you how, how things were done, so it's like, it's, sometimes it's good to leave some of these things in. Anyway, we had to clean that damn curtains again, but this one was much harder. First, it had a moving camera, second, the actors were walking all over the shot, and third, at the end of the shot the curtain goes out of focus. All very problematic things. I had a ton of work on the other million shots in this film, so uh, I asked my friend to do this one and he approached it in a pretty clever way. He just cleaned the first frame of the curtains and then tracked the camera move and attached that frame to it. 
So basically throughout the whole shot you are looking at only one clean image of the curtains. Of course it's not that easy, he had to manipulate it a little bit, warp it over time so it would match the actual footage. And of course match the out of focus blur that happens at the end of the shot. And as always painstakingly rotoscope the characters that walk over it. There's just no avoiding that. Uh, but it all worked beautifully. <laughs> All right, here's the next shot and I'll play it a few times and you try to guess what I did here. Can you guess? I hope not because that would mean I did my job poorly. Here's how the shot looked originally. This was filmed at the same time as this wide shot of the audience and this one was obviously the priority and all the extras were positioned to make it look good for the A camera. But since we always had a B camera on set, we said to the operator to film some close-ups at the same time. And of course in this shot he was missing some people. So one day when my parents visited my studio, I jumped at the opportunity and filmed them on green screen, as well as my wife and myself. I, I always take any opportunity to make silly faces, of course. Anyway, the main thing here was to match the lighting. I saw that in the original shot people have white backlight from the left, so I recreated it as best as I could and I just composited my family into the shot. It's of course very important to match the blurriness and grain in shots like these. And while I was at it, I placed a lamp on the wall to make the shot richer. I actually photographed these lamps while we were filming on location with that exact intention. And I also composited a couple of them in the wide shot as well. It just makes the shot better, doesn't it? It bugs me so freaking much that they're not perfectly centered in the shot, but unfortunately there's nothing I could do, because the placement was dictated by these lines between the panels, and I just couldn't do anything about it. I know I'm obsessing about these things probably too much, but that's how, that, that's how I am. The toilet. We are back in the toilet. We were super lucky to find a location like this with two symmetrical rows of urinals, but the problem again was that the widest lens we had captured a shot this wide. In 4.3 format you lose the sides and immediately the shot is not as impressive. So I scaled it down to be able to see all the urinals and then logically I was left with a task of extending the bottom and the top parts of the shot. If the walls were for example just white plaster, no problem, you just copy a piece of wall, feather the edge a little bit and it should blend seamlessly, it's pretty forgiving. But when you have a geometrical texture like these tiles here and the lines really have to be perfect, it's much harder. So I would take a piece of the wall and then I would have to tilt it and stretch it, you know, massage it until the lines matched and then the same thing for the left side and the floor. Oh. Now the ceiling was another story. We needed a backlight to illuminate the whole scene. And the only place we could put it was here. It was in the shot. And that was unacceptable. So for this I figured it was much easier to just recreate the whole ceiling in 3D. I referenced the photos we took during location scouting and I modeled the ceiling in Blender, complete with all the lights and ductwork. It wasn't really hard to composite it into the shot and with just a few layers of uh, fog and glow, it looked pretty good. Here's the original shot and the finished one. This sucks and this is a good shot. But then there was another scene where we also wanted to have the light source gone, but in this scene a dozen people walk into that same toilet and everyone of course passes over the ceiling. And what could I do but to painstakingly rotoscope each and every one of them and place the new ceiling behind them. It was a ton of work, but I'm really happy with these shots. Uh, I, I, I just couldn't stand that lamp being there in the final film. For a couple of shots we storyboarded this situation. Uh, one actor was on the right, outside the restroom, and you could see the rest of them inside through the door. The problem was we couldn't film a shot like this on location because there were no doors there. Uh, the room just ended. So we filmed the actor in another part of the hallway and I had to connect the two separate shots into one. The first thing I had to do was to replace this door with an open one, so I again used Blender and built a 3D door frame. And when rendered it looked pretty realistic. The next thing was to match the inside shot. And unfortunately they weren't filmed in the same way. This one was more of a low angle and this one wasn't. So they didn't really match. I mean obviously we should have uh, calculated these things and uh, measured them on set and placed the camera correctly, but on set you're just trying to survive. So we didn't. So I, I kind of found the position where the perspective mostly matched and filled the upper part with the 3D ceiling and here's the final shot. I think that considering all the problems it turned out okay. <sighs> Alright this next one is pretty funny. 
There's a scene taking place on the stairs in front of the NASA building. We filmed the people on green screen and then I composited them on the miniature background. So this is not necessarily the invisible effect shot. But here's one thing you would never guess I had to do here. During green screen filming in the studio, we needed to film these two actors from the front, but somehow we forgot to do it. Uh, we, we just probably didn't put that camera angle in the schedule and we just forgot about it, right? It happens. So we needed five to six seconds of them just standing. Our editor found one take where, where they just waited before we yelled action. And we thought, okay, we can probably just use this. But the problem was, their bodies were covered by other actors. So I did the only thing I could. Head transplant. I tracked the actor's necktie to stabilize his head and then garbage masked his body. Then I filmed my dad just standing in the angle I needed, tracked his necktie to get the data of his movement and parented the actor's head on my dad's body. And I just had a realization how weird that actually sounds. I did the same thing for the other actor except now I was one that stood in for his body. This guy, Matt, actually works out and has a nicely defined physique, if you may. And I, on the other hand, am built like, uh, like Charlie Chaplin. So I had to use the warp effect to bulk myself a little bit before putting his head on myself. So you might say that Matt is working hard, but I'm working smart. So here's the result. It's a little bit on the uncanny valley side, but in the end I needed to be so small that I didn't even need to bother with this. But it was a good experiment, and now you're never gonna be able to unsee it, and it will ruin the film for you. You're welcome. Alright, we'll finish with two more shots that were, in my opinion, the most horrible shots in the whole film, because they were the rotoscoping nightmares. Here's a shot where everyone's toasting in a bar. There's a bunch of glasses in the air, and he lifts his hand, then lowers it, then he lifts it again, and lowers it, and then he lifts it again. And of course, we needed the TV to be on. We have this old TV from the 50s and uh, we have to see if it's working. No, it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> so there was no way of doing it practically on set. There's literally no shortcuts here. You just have to rotoscope every hand separately and slowly go through the whole footage, tweaking and fixing your masks until they work. And the worst thing is, it's a 14 second shot. And in rotoscoping, each second is an eternity. Uh, this shot was again done by my friend. And uh, I mean, look how many hands there are here. It, it's a nightmare. He was doing it for days. And when he finally finished, I used his masks to put the TV footage on the screen and the hands were covering it like they would in real life. And the second shot and our last shot is pretty <coughs> <laughs> Pretty interesting, because during the editing phase we tweaked the story a little bit, as it often happens, and we added a shot of him giving the interview in front of the White House. But since the shot was added during the editing phase, it means it was never planned and it was never filmed. But we did film some footage for another scene, where he is also giving the interview. And since for the White House shot we didn't need to hear what he's saying, we could just reuse one of these takes. The only problem was, these two guys were in it, and they were not supposed to be there in the White House scene. So, by now you probably know the deal. Rotoscoping it is. And of course it's a 10 second shot this time, and uh, on a shot like this you can spend days working on it, uh, which my friend actually did. So if you're watching this, Dayan, thank you. I created the White House in Blender again. I downloaded a free model from the internet. It just wasn't reasonable building a whole miniature for one blurry background. Planted some trees and bushes in front and placed a fence right behind our character. We also filmed a couple of hands holding microphones that I composited in the foreground to fill the shot some more and perhaps distract from the fact that he was just rotoed out and pasted into the shot. So yeah, I mean this is a shot created out of nothing basically. But it's a good example of resourcefulness, I guess. And interestingly, even the expensive Hollywood productions encounter uh, similar problems. So here's one encouraging story for the end of the video. In the movie Gladiator, the legendary actor Oliver Reed passed away during production before finishing his role, before filming all of his scenes. They thought about recasting him, but they didn't want to because it was his last role and he, he was a legend, right? So just today created the whole ending scene out of the snippets from other scenes that he shot, you know, a word here or there, and they even had to digitally put his head on a body double, right? And the crazy thing is when you watch this scene, it works. You don't even know it's happening. I mean, you know if you know, but if you don't know, then the scene works perfectly, it just flows and it's, it's a very nice ending for his character in the movie. And it was a ton of invisible work just to produce this seamless experience for the viewer, right? And one last thought for the end, I think everybody should light a candle for all the rotoscoping artists out there. They deserve it. Cheers.